Maria has her degrees from AM University in Texas. Uh, her previous degrees were from the University of Guadalajara in Spain. Uh, Maria does uh, labor economics, family economics, development economics of education. And her topic tonight is going to be when crime comes to the neighborhood, short term shocks to student cognition and uh, secondary consequences. Uh, Maria, uh, normally we ask speakers to talk for about 40, 45 minutes, uh, and then there will be a questions and answers period discussion. Uh, people will be asking questions using the chat column of Zoom, and if you like, you can answer these questions uh, while you're speaking, or you can defer all the questions and answers until your presentation is over. <clears throat> As always, you ask uh, those who are attending the seminar to please Identify yourself in the chat column. And now, without <clears throat> without further ado, Maria, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Well, thank you, Leonid, for the introduction. And, well, I also want to thank Francisco for inviting me and all of you for taking the time to listen to my talk today. Today, I'll be presenting a joint work with Onsik Chang. Uh, Onsik is one of my students at the University of Tennessee. And we are actually in the works of putting together a new draft of our paper. So this comes at a very good timing. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the title of our paper is When Crime Comes to the Neighborhood, uh, Short-Term Shocks and Long-Term Consequences. And a little bit of the big picture of this paper, like what is this paper about? Uh, this paper is about how short-term shocks to student cognitive performance may have consequences for human capital development in the long run, and more specifically in how being exposed to violent crimes in the weeks before a high stakes exam, a high school placement exam, affects test scores and subsequent high school placement. And to motivate our research question, I want to show you the following headlines. Like there has been this ongoing debate on whether this type of admission or placement exams actually represent or are able to capture a student ability. So we see, for example, criticism to the high school admissions exam in New York City or in the college admission exam in China, like if there is this, well, it's like don't get rid of the test, I help black kids ace it, or the high school admission test that is dividing the city, or there is this institutionalized inequality and this urban rural divide. So When using high stakes exams, like they are often used as the unique mechanism to determine school admissions. And therefore, random shocks to cognitive function can restrict access to more preferred higher quality institutions that may, might result in a misallocation of human capital which is going to affect both education and labor outcomes in the long run. This paper uh, joins three strands of the literature. The first one is how random shocks affect cognitive function. For example, the timing of receiving uh, food stamps or the temperature of the day where students take the test or the air quality or crime exposure. And then this has an effect, for example, in judges' decisions or test scores. The second strand of the literature is on the economic consequences of relying on one-shot exams to make admission decisions. And this is in the sense that if something as random as the temperature or the air quality affects the performance in the test, maybe we should have another alternative. And then the third one is in the negative externalities of crime. So this paper specifically, we study the effects of violent crimes on a high school entrance uh, test course. 
and subsequent placement. We allow our model to capture uh, differential responses by gender, and we also explore the mechanisms that are driving our main results. We answer to this question in the context of Mexico City, which we consider a natural setting uh, for our analysis for several reasons, but the most important too is that the growing demand for high school education led to the implementation of a centralized system of admissions with this uh, high stakes exam that is given 100% of the weight for admission. And the second good reason is that what a better place to study crime than a violent place, right? So violent crimes occur across school neighborhoods all over Mexico City, and then we have a lot of variation, both geographical and temporal in crime exposure. So this is going to limit the scope for selection in our results. Then uh, in terms of the identification strategy, we use a difference in differences research design. And we combine this with administrative data on crime uh, reports. So we have incident level crime data. And one important feature of our data is that we have the geographic coordinates of crime. We also have education data. So we have a student level test course, and we also have the geographic coordinates of the schools where students are currently enrolled. We use direct measures of a student's crime exposure within a neighborhood of their schools uh, during the run-up to exam dates. So before getting into the details, let me uh, tell you about our results. We find that being exposed to violence have no effect on male students' test scores. We have that female test, uh, test scores decrease by 11% of a standard deviation, but this is in a very close neighborhood to the school within 0.1 miles or two to three blocks and the one week before the exam. And this has consequences in the quality of education that they receive later on because 19% of these female students exposed to crime are placed in less preferred lower quality high school. We find that the effects are highly local. So as I mentioned earlier, like they uh, become significant beyond 0.1 mile and in two or three weeks uh, after exposure. This suggests then that it is temporary psychological harm, like one of the main mechanisms driving these results. And we actually provide empirical evidence that when exposed to crime, female students are more likely than male students to report having concentration problems. So the contributions of this paper uh, before providing, uh, after, be besides providing uh, more evidence on the effect of crime exposure on test scores is that we provide further evidence by capturing the mismatch or the misallocation of human capital of female students due to crime exposure. And we also identify the mechanisms uh, behind the differential effects by gender. The data that we use comes from the Ministry of Education. This is individual level data in an admissions exam, a COMIPEM. So we have the test scores from 2013 to 2016. We have a demographic survey with a student characteristics. We also, uh, we only keep students who live and go to school in Mexico City and we have the geographic coordinates for, of middle schools. The second source of data is the Ministry of Public Security in Mexico City. In here we have incident level data on crime reports. This data has information on the date and the time of the crime. 
and we also have the geographic coordinates of each crime. The last source of information is from the National Institute of Statistics and Geography, and from there we get the urban poverty index and population. And this information is at the census data, uh, at the census area level that we use to perform heterogeneous effect across students in higher poverty and lower poverty areas. For the high school assignment process, let me tell you a little bit how it works. Uh, in February and March, students register for the exam. Uh, they send a preference list that has up to 20 schools. And in that time, the students fill out the demographic survey. And another uh, information that we use is that we have the high school's pass cutoff scores uh, for each of the high schools that the students are applying. Uh, in June, the students take the exam. This exam uh, has 128 uh, questions, multiple choice questions, and they cover like, a lot of subjects. So we have math, Spanish, biology, geography, physics, chemistry. In July, uh, each school uh, reports the maximum number of available seats in their school to COMIPEMS. And uh, students are then ranked from the highest to the lowest score. And then they start the assignment mechanism uh, from the highest performing students uh, being uh, placed in their most preferred school that has seats available. Uh, something uh, important about COMIPEMS is that test score is the only determinant of admission. So they don't use GPA or essays or extracurricular activities. None of that is taken into consideration. The students have no discretion over when they take the test or where they take the test. And another important thing that this is not like a pass or fail test, a marginal difference, even like one point is going to have predicted power on future education quality. And the high school uh, selection and admission process uh, occur during and after a student's final year in middle school. The data at the end of the day looks as follows. So we have a panel of 1,200 or roughly 1,200 middle schools from 2013 to 2016. Our observations are at the student level, so we have roughly 400,000 observations and we have test scores and individual characteristics. We have, we define violent crimes as homicides and firearm injuries. We do so because we think that they are more salient and they are also, also less likely to be on their report. We also have information on other violent crimes that we define as rape and various types of thefts uh, with violence, such as robbery, for example. And then for non-violent crimes that are other types of thefts uh, without violence, like burglary and larceny. Then uh, this is Mexico City. This is the geographic distribution of homicides and firearm injuries, as well as middle school. A takeaway from this map is that the crime, crime is not like concentrated in one specific area, so it is all over the city and we have variation within municipalities and close to, to the schools. So at the, end, at, at the end of the day, we have 830 incidents that happen one month before the exam, and that's the variation that we are going to be used to identify our results.
then if we make just a close up to one of the municipalities, we see, for example, in orange, all of the middle schools in Mexico City, and then we have the incidence of both homicides and firearm injuries. And then we have uh, what we are going to perform in our difference in differences or the type of variation that we are going to use in our difference in difference strategy is being exposed within a certain distance from the school. We do like a donut analysis, whether they were exposed within 0.1 mile or between 0.1 and 0.2 or between like 0.2 and point three. So for example, for this school, this school was treated within point one mile, but not within point two or within point three. Or this one here was treated within point two, but not within point one or point three. So this is going to be important because our control group doesn't change over time. So it's not that we just expand our distance and perform different analysis, but we run the specification using all of the distances in the same regression. So as I mentioned earlier, we use a difference in difference strategy that exploits uh, within a school variation in exposure to violent crime over time. And we perform this in the run up to, to the test. More formally, this is the regression specification that we estimate. We have test scores of a student I, a school S, a year T. D indexes the distance. So we have the distance, for example, 0 0.1 is 0 to 0 0.1, 0 0.2 is 0.1 to 0.2, and then 0 0.3 is 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 and we allowed the estimates to differ by gender so in here uh, we have a differential effect for females we include a student characteristics such as parental education or previous performance we have a school fixed effects and then we also have time fixed effects and our error term that we allow to be correlated within the school so at the end of the day, our coefficient of interest will be delta one and delta two. And delta one capture the intent to treat effect on male students. Delta one plus delta two captures the average treatment effect for female students and delta two capture directly the differential effect on females or the gender gap in test scores. The identifying assumption for this is the parallel trends assumption. And then since we don't have a panel of students, but rather we have a panel of schools, but the students are different every, every year. So it's also important that the composition of students in exposed and non-exposed schools did not change systematically over time. We are going to provide a, a lot of graphical evidence and regression-based evidence to support the possibility of these assumptions. And we relax the assumptions by including a school specific time trends or by including a school municipality by year fixed effects and residence municipality by year fixed effects. So this is a very ugly table. Uh, I apologize beforehand, but I think it's uh, important uh, that we see that our results are very robust to different specifications. So in the first column, we have the estimated effects, for example, within 0.1 mile, within 0.2 miles, and within 0.3 miles for both uh, male and female students. In the first column, we have the baseline specification that includes a school fixed effects and year fixed effects. Uh, we see this negative effect in the gender gap, but then it's like we don't see much going on otherwise. Then in the next column, we include parental education, like whether their parents have a high school degree or a college degree or some postgraduate education. 
in the third column, we control for a student academic ability. We have information on the GPA of the student during the second grade or the cumulative GPA during the uh, set, well, let me say eighth grade in middle school. And then uh, we also have that information for math GPA. We include both in this regression. So this controls for previous academic ability or some measure of ability of the student. We also include other uh, individual characteristics that also might affect test scores. Specifically, we control for the number of books at home. And we also control for whether the students have access to a computer in their house. Then in the fourth, uh, in the fifth column, uh, we relax the parallel trends assumption by including uh, a school specific time trend. And then we see that our estimate is very robust to including the trends. So in my, uh, this is good uh, for our identification assumption or it provides evidence in favor of it and then we might think it's like well it's like maybe it's not like so great that you are comparing people from different areas in Mexico City so in the next column I include a school municipality by year fixed effects and then in the next one it's like well it's like maybe students that live in different municipalities are different so what i do in the next column is to include residents municipality by year fixed effects so so far oh, i've shown that the estimates are robust to including time bearing characteristics of the students to relaxing the parallel trends assumption by including a school specific trends by to comparing students in the same school municipality and to comparing students in the same residence municipality. Then what we do next is well let's vary the timing instead of just allowing them to be exposed like within the week uh, before the exam let's expand this to four weeks so we do the regressions for being exposed one week before the exam. This is being exposed two weeks before the exam or three weeks or four weeks. So this is very reassuring that as we expand our time window, the estimates get smaller and smaller, but they are still negative for females and we see no effects for males or no effects at further distances. Then what we do is, well, let's combine both of those, right? Instead of of opening this time window, let me just see what happens if they were exposed only like during the week before the exam or two weeks before the exam or three or four. So we do an event study by, by the timing or the weeks before the exam. So in here, uh, we see a negative effect of being exposed during the week before the exam, but then we don't see much for two to four or five weeks uh, before the exam. Then we also capture the effects of being exposed after the exam. This is a placebo exercise just to see if we are not capturing trends. And then we see that there is not much going on when they are exposed to crime after the exam. We, this, uh, all of these come from the same regression. So we do the same exercise with 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3 miles. And overall, there doesn't seem to be uh, something else going on in here. Then it's like, well, that maybe is something special about being exposed like to 0 0.1 mile. Like it's like you were like just data mining and trying to find an effect so what we did then is let's change that distance and then do an event study by distance of being exposed to crime within 0 0.05 or 0 0.1, 0 0.15. So what we see is that for 0 0.05, uh, the point estimate is very similar to 0 0.1. It's like less, uh, it's more noisy because there are of course less students that are exposed to crime within like one block from their school. And then the effect becomes pretty much zero uh, afterwards. 
So thus far, we have shown that a student's exposure to violent crime in the week immediately prior to the commitments exam lowers test scores by 11% of a standard deviation, and we find no effects on males. So the question then is, well, do decreased scores for girls have consequences, right? It's like if they have like one or two points, but then at the end of the day, it doesn't affect the, the, the outcome then that's not much of a problem. But then what we show next is that, yes, it does have consequences. Uh, we use the cutoff scores at each high school and the counterfactual scores to quantify the share of female students that are affected by lower test scores. And we find that one in five girls exposed to crime are assigned to less preferred lower quality high schools. So we still have other threats to identification. If you remember, like I lost a bunch of observations after I controlled for individual characteristics. So non-random attrition will be a threat to identification or non-random selection, or if there are systematic differences between exposed and non-exposed uh, schools. So the first one is, we test for attrition. So since we lost roughly 15% of our sample, what we see as well is like, does this have an effect? Like are girls more likely to leave the sample than boys and so forth? And then we see overall, like there is no uh, significant effect for either time, any timing of exposure of any distance of exposure. So, we rule out that it's random, like non-random attrition. Then the next one is like, well, it's like maybe parents of high-performing students are en enrolling their children in schools without any local violent crimes. So what we are capturing might just be uh, this mechanic effect that if you take away the good, the good uh, students, and then you will be capturing a negative effect. But then uh, we estimate a regression, like a balancing test with a bunch of all of the individual characteristics that we observe. I'm just going to show you two in the presentation. Uh, we do the effect on having a community math GPA in the lowest quartile. And then overall, we see no differences between boys and girls. And then we do the same thing, but with the cumulative GPA, like there are no systematic difference in here. And then in the paper, you can see the 10 tables showing all of the different characteristics here. So it seems that it's non-random selection, right? But then it's like, you might still be concerned that those students that are in schools that are exposed to violence, uh, are systematic, systematically different from those non-exposed. So are we just capturing these systematic differences? And what we do is, well, let me just use the variation in schools, in schools that were ever exposed to crime uh, within the month before the exam uh, or after the exam. And then we are using like roughly 55% of our original sample, and we have virtually the same results than if using the whole sample. So it seems that it's not systematic differences between students in exposed and non-exposed schools. Then it's like, well, the next question is like, why are girls more affected than boys? And one explanation is, well, maybe girls have different behavioral responses than boys do. So the data has some information on mental health outcomes. The context questionnaire or the survey asks the following two questions. So these are yes or not questions. Do you face concentration problems? The second question is, do you face emotional problems such as anxiety, stress, fear, etc.? So that's like, exactly how the questions are framed in the survey. 
and we use these two questions and the timing in which students answer the survey to estimate the effects of crime exposure on mental health. And when we look, for example, at the effects on reporting having concentration problems, like girls are more likely to report having concentration problems if they uh, were exposed to violence one week before they fill the survey or two weeks before maybe, but it's not a statistically significant. And then we see uh, pretty much like zero effect in three to five weeks before. And then we see that they were exposed after the pre-registration period or after they answered the survey, like we see no effect. So this is also reassuring for identification. Then uh, we run the regression with 0.2 miles and 0.3 miles, and then these are in line with the results that we find on test scores. Then we do other analysis. Uh, we use other violent crimes and non-violent crimes. Like those results, like those results uh, should be taken with a grain of salt because there is a lot of endogenous reporting, right? So it, if it'll be, for example, uh, higher income people or people with a better socioeconomic status might be more likely to report being robbed in the train or something but than lower income people. So there might be more uh, endogeneity in the reporting of crime in there. But overall, we find no effects of other violent crimes and non-violent crimes. We also estimate the effects differentiating by poverty and by crime level. If we think, for example, of people that is used to crime, like if you see someone being killed every other day, it's just like, oh yeah, that's normal, right? But then it's like, if you are less exposed to crime, then you might have more uh, strong effects than, than those that are used to it. So the, what we find is a stronger effects for females in high poverty schools and in low crime school neighborhoods. But I want to highlight here that they are not statistically different from each other. Then we separate the effects, whether uh, there are differential responses to having to answer questions about math and sciences or when you have to use reasoning versus when you have to answer about stuff that you memorize but we also found no differential effects then uh we with my thing is like well it's like who are the students that are being the most affected are those in the lower end of the test score distribution or low performing students or are those like in the high end of the test score distribution uh we perform an unconditional quantile regression analysis and we find negative effects of the gender gap through the test score distribution we find a G effect, so it's like a smaller effect in the lower end and in the upper end of the distribution and larger in, for the average student or those around the median. So to conclude, what we found were asymmetric negative effects on female students' test scores that resulted in a poor matching between female students and high school or a misallocation of human capital. This then exacerbates gender inequality in education. And we also provided evidence that crime-driven concentration problems are one of the mechanisms of driving these negative effects on, on female test scores. So this is all that I have for today. Uh, if you have any questions, like, I'll be happy to answer them. And also if you have some feedback or anything you want to contact me, uh, this is my, my email. Thanks very much, Maria. This is a lot of food for thought. Uh, let's see if there are any questions or comments. I don't see anything yet in the chat column. So please, if you have a question, speak up or identify yourself I do. yes 
Denis. Uh, uh, thank Stas you for the presentation. Uh, during the presentation, I was wondering why can, why don't you try to estimate the effect of crime, not uh, which was occur occurred within the district of school, but within the district where a, a student lives, for example. Like, do you have such uh, information on, on that? Like, I, I, I guess, like, a student usually spends more time at home, therefore, like, he can or she can hear more about violence that happening around rather than about close to school. So, like, do you have this? Right. So, actually, we don't have information on where the students live. Uh, we have only information of the school that they attend. So in order, in order to, so that's like the effects, I would expect actually the effects to be larger if they were exposed in their neighborhood or of like where they live than in the school. But yeah, we don't have that, that information in our data. Okay, fair okay, and Thanks. The following, the following question, right? But, uh, uh, for example, in Russia, it's common that you usually go to school that is closer to you. Like usually, people go to school that is close. And, and what about the the situation in Mexico? Like, is it the same, or you can apply for the school that is in the different neighborhood? Like, what is the percent of what is the percentage of students who go to this school? Maybe if it's like very high, then you can use like uh, school as a proxy for living in in the same neighborhood. So we have a large share of students that walk to school, but actually in Mexico, there are no restrictions on the schools that you can attend. So you can live in uh, a different municipality than the municipality at which you go to school. And, but I would say, I think I have this information in the paper that at least 50% or 55 percent of the students walk to school so they know they live nearby and in order to like mitigate the concerns about like whether the residents uh, or being exposed to crime in the residents uh, what we do or the best we can do is to include the municipality of residents by year fixed effect so we are not able to capture like the neighborhood effect, but rather like the larger area, like the municipality at which the student live. Okay, <clears throat> thanks very much. Please, anyone else? Uh, let me see. Uh, Maria, if you, if you please, while people are still thinking about their questions, I'd like to ask mine uh, first. Uh, do you ever try to understand why is it the case that girls are more sensitive to being exposed to crime? Uh, is it psychological? Is it uh, uh, cognitive? Is it uh, maybe some literature on uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, can help you a little bit? What is the mechanism and why you observe the gender difference? And if you please, uh, the second uh, you, uh, you have two variables. One is uh, space and the other one is time. It's the distance from the crime and the time passed from the crime. And as far as I understand, you, to, you take dummies uh, less than one-tenth of a mile, less than one-tenth, two-tenth. Why not take continuous variables, both for time and for the distance? I think that might give some interesting uh, uh, insight into your analysis. And the final one is, uh, uh, it's about identification. Uh, can you think of any uh, exogenous variation that explain crime rates, crime incidents? So they can use two steps and uh, instrument the crime and then, you know, uh, address the concern of endogeneity. All right, so let me see if I got all of your questions. Uh, the first one, and actually that was something that I was very puzzled when we first found this differential effect by gender. Uh, I thought that it was just the mechanics of the high stakes exams that female students usually have lower performance than male students. 
but then it's like after we keep doing like more and more and more analysis i like we convince ourselves that yes there is this differential effect and then we are starting getting more into the mental health literature in how both males and females respond differently to being exposed to crime. And I would say one of the reasons that girls are more sensitive than boys are is maybe like even the culture of in Mexico that is for boys, it's like, hey, you are a man, like, you don't get scared. But then if you are a girl, it's like, oh, it's like people have to take care of me. So that could be one of the things. And what we were able to do empirically was to just look at these two questions on mental health that were in the questionnaire and then see, for example, that it seems to be cognitive, that it seems to be this differential gender response on having concentration problems. We were not able to capture much uh, using uh, anxiety or fear, but I think like that questions that question is more broad. Like probably if they were asked separately, like do you have fear? Do you have anxiety? We will be able to capture something, but those estimates are more um, are noisier than the ones for having concentration problems. Then uh, in terms of using the continuous variable, that's something that we thought about doing, but then it gets a little bit challenging in terms of what is the exposure that is affecting you, because you might have, for example, crimes occurring like the week before the exam within certain distance and then two weeks before the exam within like another distance and then it gets more difficult to be able to identify which crime is the one that is affecting you. So something okay. that we explore was to do uh, steal the buffer and then within the buffer get the distance from each of the crime and then just interact them. And we found very similar results than the results that we have here, but still like more noisy because we still didn't know uh, whether, um, we, we still like just didn't know how to handle the continuity of the distance because you might have crimes happening at a very far distance and others just like very close proximity. So we, we are following here uh, the literature on exposure and crime. Like this is one of the ways like just doing circles around the neighborhood or around the school. And yeah, like the best we can do with that is the event study analysis by distance where is, instead of just having this 0.1, 0.2, let's just break it even more to 0 0.05, um, 0.1, and 0.2. And then the last question uh, regarding uh, the exogenous shock in crime incidents. Uh, what we might think is that even though like some areas are more prone to crime than others, like the event of having the crime happening just in the week before the exam, that would be more exogenous than just crime rate in general. Like that's one of the reasons that we don't use the crime rate uh, for that. Um, yeah, so like the other thing that we do for identification is just to see, well, it's like if they were exposed after the exam, it's like, will we expect an effect? And then we see no effect from there. Okay, well, thanks very much. That answers my questions. Maria has a question, so if you can please look in your chat column, or maybe Maria can ask it herself. Yeah, um, let, let me let me ask a question. So first of all, thanks for a very interesting presentation. It sounds like a totally different world from what we have for here, especially sitting home with no chances to be here, like under crime on the streets and everything. So my question is, um, do you, some, do you somehow or differentiate between different types of crime uh, in terms of how health, for example, is related 
whether physical health is affected during the crime or is just like such sociological threat and sociological problem. So for example, if you have to go to doc doctor and you like feel pain, it's really hard for you to concentrate or like on the exam. That my first question and my second question would be, uh, if, we, if we survey people after exam, so some people might use a crime as a self excuse for not very good results. So if my results are not that good as, as expected, and you ask me if I was like subject to some violence, I might think, okay, aha, there are some people who like talk to me badly. That's why I got C at the exam. Uh, so if, if uh, probably it might be a case or, and which can explain a little bit the difference between like uh, genders. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so in terms of physical health or whether they go to the doctor, like we, we don't have uh, any information on that. And that, that'll be like definitely a possibility, uh, but we just don't have information on that. Like the only thing that we have in here is whether um, they take the exam. So usually students register for the exam and then uh, at the end of the day, it's like, well, it's like maybe like boys or girls are less or more likely to take the exam. Like those that were exposed to crime, like they just didn't take the test. And then we don't see that uh, as, as a problem. And in terms of your, Of your second question, um, we yeah no the thing is that we don't have information on that. Something that we wish we had was, for example, attendance like during the week before the exam, like whether, for example, boys were more likely to just miss school and then go and prepare for the exam, or whether uh, girls uh, just like didn't go to school and then they miss some of the preparation in the school. So that's kind of the, the threats to identification that we haven't been able to, to work on, but it's like we just don't have the data to do it. Thank you. Good, thanks very much. Let's see if there is anyone else. Do I have a question. Please, Francisco. Okay. No, no, just uh, yeah. uh, I want to ask about channels, uh, Henry. Uh, probably you oh, heard the uh, answer it in the last question, but uh, one of the channels can be that, for example, after crime, female students they uh, felt unsafe, and probably they missed some classes. Uh, do you can observe how much time students spent in the school after crime? So, because you showed that the uh, results are different uh, when you control for time after one, two, three weeks, and it depends on also on distance. So, if it's possible to to see how, I mean, how much time they spent in the school, probably if they felt unsafe, so they can think, okay, I have just one week before exam and I can stay at home. Right, so they do like go back to um, the comment that I had earlier that a school, um, it, it, this is definitely a possibility and that's not something that we can do uh, anything about it because of the limitations of the data. But yeah, definitely it could be that it is in part uh, a school supply that is driving this yeah. effect. Okay. Thanks. Francisca identified himself as a Me Too person, so Francisca, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I know Maria, but I didn't know this study before, so uh, this is new information for me. Um, so one of the things you do in the paper is um, to check the misplacement that this causes, right? So you perform worse in the exam and then you are placed in a school, less desired school, but uh, this does not imply that it's a lower quality school. It's just less desire. And you kind of relate 
uh, the position uh, that the student gives to this school uh, with the quality. So um, I was wondering how you, you control or you define quality in this case, because you, you can go to your third option and it could still be a good quality, highly demanded school. And uh, similar to this of the, of, of the placement in the exam, um, so the quality of schools, uh, it's, it, it varies a lot within the, the city. I mean, it's, it correlates with the neighborhood. And so uh, what happens with this exam is that if you do a very bad exam, you are sent to the closest school you have. They don't care about quality, but that is closer to you. And other uh, uh, other uh, mechanisms come into place, and then um, if you do very good in your exam, you go to the school you you liked, and this school is 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 further away. It's most of the times in the south of the city, and you show in the map that in the south of the city there's almost no crime at all. And so I was wondering how this could could play could uh, threaten your identification strategy and and how could also this, uh, because obviously students who come from impoverished backgrounds, who suffer crime more often, they go closer to, the, to their neighborhood and everything is to their school is in their neighborhood and everything's indigenous and different to those students who cross the city. And so, and if you have tried to um, separate your uh, estimations by at least north and south of the city, which is like two different, worlds apart south and north of Mexico City. And the other thing is, um, the last part is uh, you use at some point the math questions and the um, uh, humanities questions, right, to test uh, differences. Just uh, one clarification, the math questions in that exam are very different, are two, group, two different groups. One is uh, related to logic thinking and the other is knowledge. Uh, so like grouping them in one in one uh, probably is not the best uh, strategy and it would be interesting in order to test this idea of if it's affecting cognitive or if it's other things like it it's just distracting you or making you stressful uh, it would be good to use just the math part with which tests cognitive uh, uh, in uh, innate skills or they try to measure this I don't know if very good. Gonna... Yeah, yeah, very good. Eh? Uh, I like that question. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Marie. Right. Well, uh, with respect to the placement, and like, what we uh, are, what we do in the paper is like, if you are placed in a lower ranked school, you have lower quality peers. Like all of the students in the other school have higher scores than the school at which you are going to go. And we also uh, rely on a couple of papers that show, for example, that being, ex being placed in the school, like right above the cutoff, uh, you have smaller classes, you have um, better, quality, better quality teachers in terms of whether they have graduate education or not, but then it's like we are relying more on the composition of the peers, like the composition of the peers is better in the higher ranked school at which you could, you could not get because everybody in that school have a better uh, score than you do. That's like the way that we think about uh, quality. And then when thinking about the types of neighborhoods, like the only thing we could do is just to separate the analysis with using the poverty index, which is now like the urban poverty index, like that's at the census block area. So we separate them like <laughs> above and below the median, uh, but we haven't performed uh, any analysis that it's more on like regional analysis like let's just i think like a lot of it is controlled with the municipality of residence and the municipality of the school by time fix effects but uh it, it'll, it'll be interesting if there are differential effects actually if we run the analysis like just breaking the city like the north side and the south side to see 
if that's um, different. And I think I said, well, we started we are going to include in our new draft. And then uh, with respect to the questions in the way that group that we group them is actually, as you mentioned, like we do uh, math and reasoning or math reasoning uh, in the same group. And we didn't perform the analysis separately for all of them because it's only like 12 questions per, per subject. So uh, we like in there like um, just break, we kind of like break it down like that much in, in our sample. So something that we could do is for example, group the reasoning for both like reading and comprehension and math. And then those that are about knowledge, those that are about reasoning that would be like, one thing that we can definitely do, but we haven't done it. Good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Please, anyone else? Uh, while people are thinking, I would like to ask another question if I may. Uh, what if uh, someone is exposed to multiple crimes? I'm not sure if I understood how you handle that. Uh, do you have any cumulative effect? And then a related question is, uh, if uh, I live in a high crime neighborhood, and if I'm constantly exposed to crime, then I'm kind of hardened, you know, crime is an uh, everyday reality, in which case uh, the exposure effect might be not as pronounced as if I were living in a safe neighborhood and all of a sudden I see some someone is robbed at gunpoint, broad daylight. So can you, can you talk about that as well, please? Yes. So actually, uh, with respect to the number of crimes, the way that we are defining is, is just like a dummy variable of whether you were exposed to crime. Most of, in most of the cases, we have uh, one or two crimes happening within a window of a one week window from the exam. And, um, but we don't include the intensity or the number of crimes within that because we were worried that our variable would be more endogenous if we include the number of crimes because those that are continuously being exposed to crime are systematically different from those that are just like a one shot uh, thing. So the way that we define this is just a dummy variable whether they were exposed like if it was like a hundred crimes or one crime is defined the same way and um with respect to the high crime and low crime uh we actually perform an analysis of that I just mentioned here a little bit earlier, but I didn't show you any of the results. So what we do is we take the pre-treatment uh, homicide rates in the census block, and then we separate those two into high crime and low crime, uh, just those above the median and below the median uh, crime rate in there. In their census area and what we find in there is actually uh, what you just mentioned right it's like if you are exposed to crime continuously you might become less sensitive to being exposed to crime but then if this is like something new to you then if you live in a low crime area you are going to be definitely more scared than if this is what you see every day so this is actually in line of what we find in the paper. Very good. Thank Thanks you. very much, Maria. Uh, let's see, uh, Ma Maria, please, Maria. Yeah, I still have another question. It might su sound a little bit stupid, but still to understand how it works. And who decides on the school? Are, are students make choices or are they parents? Because, sir, uh, in most cases, I do believe that for schools, it's not the child itself who decides, especially if he or she should be either accompanied by an adult or goes to the city, or are normally parents who decide that they can afford that. So 
uh, I might think a little bit about uh, including the reasoning of parents and how they react on like crime towards the children. And that might probably explain the gender effect because normally parents, they worry more about girls, right? In right. the sense of going through the city, be exposed to crime, etc. So for parents who have girl, it's more important signal. Okay, I should do something about that. And for boys, okay, boys are boys. Even it might be the case here. Sorry again, I, I just don't know how it works in Mexico, but for Russia, that might be an explanation. Right. So, um, with respect to uh, your first question, like who decides with the students or the parents, I would say that that will be a combination of both. And those, for example, many students in Mexico City have parents that have never gone to high school and then it's like they just might not even know like whether the high school is good or bad. Um, and in there, like maybe the teachers help the kids to choose uh, who are the ones that, like what are like the good schools or which schools you should choose. Um, but this is actually something that we've been thinking of doing, like to see if being exposed to crime affect your aspirations, whether it affected uh, the quality of the high schools that the students or parents or a combination of both uh, will, will uh, choosing. And then uh, in respect to this cultural uh, differences or gender, uh, gender uh, norms in, in the city. And I would say like that's one of the reasons probably that girls are more affected by boys is just because maybe we are just less exposed to, to violence overall. And, yeah. Good point. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Francisco. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Francisco. Yes, uh, just another quick comment. Um, so uh, you also relate the misplacement with a long-term uh, effects, right? Uh, if you are misplaced and you go to a worse high school and then you probably are going to end up in a worse uh, university on average and then it affects your uh, life cycle earnings. Uh, nonetheless, this could be only true for those who cannot afford a private education because what happens in uh, richer households is that if they don't do well in the exam, they just simply go to uh, private, um, top quality private uh, university. So it would be uh, probably good to um, make this uh, specification or clarification in the, in the uh, conclusion when you uh, speak about long term effects. That's right. And actually, that would be something that we wish we could do, like to just look at the long term consequences more broadly, because uh, many of these students, so this exam started in 1996. Probably you, Francisco, took the yeah. exam. I, I, took it, I took it. I was but one then of the like, Then you can see, uh, I don't know, maybe he got into an UNAM high school and then went to yeah. UNAM and then he got his PhD from Essex. So it's like <laughs> these things that affect one over the other. But it's like in terms of those that cannot afford private education, I, I think like something that is reassuring about the results that is like low like high poverty areas, those that are being the most affected. But we definitely uh, should be able to capture something uh, in terms of maybe if they are coming from a private or public middle school and then see uh, whether they are more or less likely to attend. But uh, yeah, that's, those are very good points and we should consider them. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Well, it uh, uh, looks like we've nearly exhausted our questions. Let me make sure that's the case. Uh, anyone else, please? Uh, Maria, thanks very much. It was extremely eye-opening. Uh, you were able to put together several strands of uh, research, uh, crime, education, human capital. 
and also told us something quite interesting about how the Mexican system works. Well, Thanks a lot thank for, for finding the time to talk at our seminar. Very much appreciated. Uh, we meet again next time, uh, next week, right, Stas? And uh, yep, our, topic ne our topic yep. next week, if you can please remind to everyone. Yeah, George Garcia Ambrados uh, from Autonomous University of Madrid. He is going to present the paper on the effects of communist indoctrination, evidence from two educational reform in Poland. Very interesting. All right. Well, I would like to thank everyone once again. We'll see each other in a week. Special thanks to Maria. Be safe and have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. For thank your you. Feedback. Thank you, Maria. Thank you.